Hey students, um, so I'm gonna warn you up front, this one's gonna be a little bit rambly. Um, what I'm gonna be trying to do here is go over part two of the course, which was about resistance to colonialism, um, looking at readings from Ireland and Africa. And I'm gonna try and sum up some of what you hopefully were thinking about as you went through these texts. Um, and also, if I can, connect it to um, all kinds of other political moments, uh, including the present day and where we are right now. We might even make it to Black Lives Matter, um, the Occupy movement, etc. So uh, take a breath and um, here we go. I'll, I'm going to start with just quickly looking at the Irish material. So um, in the class so far, we have read um, we've looked at caricatures from Cheng's Joyce Race and Empire um, that appeared in contemporary newspapers um, during colonialism. We read Edmund Burke's uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France and the letter to Richard Burke. Um, we uh, looked at a host of Irish songs and poetry that you all brought in. We read Hyde's essay on the necessity for de-anglicizing Ireland, Joyce's short story, Araby, Yeats's poems. Um, some of you may have read the optional Carlton Pilgrim of Lofdurg. So what those readings have in common, what I, the reason I tried to present them to you is that many of them are talking about um, sort of what happens to a country under colonialism, but then also how do we resist it? What are the right methods? And one of the main issues that a lot of these readings were struggling with actually had to do with, especially a lot of the poems and songs that you all found yourselves and looked at, were struggling with the question of violent resistance. And you know, if you are in a situation where your right to vote has been taken away, where your religion is excluding you from participating in politics, when um, your nation has been taken over by another nation, where you're being taxed ruinously heavily, where um, the people around you are dying because of starvation caused uh, in large part because when a famine hits and there's a potato blight or a drought, the colonial government um, is not spending the resources to keep you and your, your neighbors alive, they're um, reaping profits to enrich themselves back home, right? When you look at, you know, beautiful homes in something like Downton Abbey, um, or when you look at all the wonderful things that were accumulated in the British Museum, I hope that at this point in the course, you are also seeing, oh, all of that wealth, all of that treasure, was stolen and built on the deaths of um, colonized peoples, right? Okay, so, so you're in this terrible situation. How do you resist? Um, sometimes there's a, an organized national resistance. Often people are too broken down for that. And what you get instead are pockets of resistance. You get small groups forming. Um, and in the case of Ireland, you get the IRA. Um, and since they don't have access to a military, they don't have the wealth to build big weapon systems, et cetera, so on, usually um, guerrillas fighting against a government, what we've been seeing, especially in the last few decades, is they often turn to pretty reprehensible tactics. Right, they may start off just bombing, say, military um, supplies, but then at some point someone realizes, oh, if we send suicide bombers into the cities, we're going to get a much stronger response. We can we can hurt them more. Um, if you uh, start running out of people um, who can fight for you because they're all dying, all the young men in Ireland dying well, maybe we're going to start recruiting child soldiers. Maybe we're even going to essentially coerce or force people to fight for us um, because the situation is just that bad, right? That's the kind of uh, 
justification that people put forward um, in my own country of Sri Lanka, we had 30 years of civil conflict and the Tamil Tigers were a minority um, ethnic group that ended up that started off with a lot of noble ideals and people, including my own parents, sent money to support the boys back home um, in their fight for justice. Uh, but then over time, their methods became uh, more and more troubling and uh, really morally hard to justify. Okay, so one argument that you could think about, you might want to write about this in your final paper has to do with um, is it even possible to resist violently um, without falling into sort of big moral problems without, you know, is there's a saying that power corrupts, um, does violence corrupt when you, uh, and this is essentially in some ways, I have friends who are pacifists, if you know any Quakers, they may fall into this category, they, um, they sort of believe that once you start taking violent actions, um, you it, it becomes a slippery slope and you quickly become, it becomes easier and easier to justify more violent actions and eventually you, you end up in a really dark place. So, okay, so you've got all of that framing in mind. Um, let's look at Africa now for a minute. So we read instead of reading a bunch of short things, we mostly focused on Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. So in this novel, we talked about heroism and whether this protagonist, Okonkwo, is a hero. And part of that has to do with, and hopefully you watched the other video where we I went into this in a lot more depth, but um, part of this has to do with this question of, is he, really representing his people and what they believe? Is he standing up for that? And are they going to support him and follow him in his attempts to resist British colonialism, right? And um, we see no, right? If you got to the end of the book, you find out that in fact, um, the people do not follow him and he dies as a result, um, despairing. And so, Another aspect of this whole question of resistance, it has to do with, you know, who is your leader? Um, how do they establish themselves as being worth following? Do they stand for things that you think are worth um, fighting for, maybe killing for, maybe dying for, right? Um, and I'm recording this the day after the election, and we still don't know the results. Um, so this is very pertinent to the present moment. Across America, people have chosen who they think their leaders should be. And um, hopefully, presumably, they have thought at least a little bit about whether this person stands for what they want to, what they stand for themselves, right? So, um, so that's another element to resistance that you can kind of think about. And, and also how do these leaders position themselves, right? And what did they play on in order to get people to follow them? If you look at those Irish songs and poetry, um, one angle for an essay might be looking at things like, how did they um, appeal to the reader, the listener? How do they manipulate the reader and the listener? What are they calling on to convince young men to go off and fight for Ireland um, or and possibly kill for Ireland, right? Um, and possibly die for Ireland. So, uh, so in any case, so that's when you, and when you listen to any politician today, um, and I'll include myself in that because I ran for library board and I was elected. So, you know, I made not quite speeches, but I was at community forums where I had to talk about what I stood for. And um, so when you listen to, to anyone running for office, um, what you should be asking is, what you should be thinking in your head is, okay, what are they saying about themselves? Um, do I believe in that? But also, how are they pitching themselves? How are they positioning themselves? Um, is it, I don't know how to put this, like, you know, do I think there's, do they seem sincere? Or do I think they're saying what they need to say to get the votes? Um, and you know, sadly, as you kind of go 
up in levels, I think um, more and more you're going to see people at higher levels um, taking positions in order to get as many votes as possible because unless you get elected, you can't actually do very much, right? So, um, so all of that is kind of uh, for an English lit class, that's an interesting thing to look at in terms of writing and rhetoric and the the way writers are positioning themselves. Um, uh, if another aspect of this, um, if you went on and looked at Soyinka, I, I'll just note we read the line in the jewel, but it was optional. And um, for the most part, I would say this is um, more about the influence of modernity than like direct resistance, but where it does tie in has to do with um, how you adapt or don't adapt, how you resist. And the school teacher kind of is slavishly following British attitudes and ends up losing the girl as a result. Whereas the chief, um, who's kind of horrible. And, and in fact, you know, the whole play is terribly sexist and um, problematic. He deceives and lies this, to this girl to get her to sleep with him, et cetera. But he, where he succeeds, it's in large part because he is able to use technology, this stamp machine that he's gonna put her photo on, um, which she finds very attractive uh, as a way to support his position um, as leader of this village. He's, he's kind of setting himself out there as like as nation building and it's, it's kind of fascinating. Um, so if you're writing something where you're looking at how people um, use rhetoric and language to manipulate other people for the purposes of say winning an election or seducing a girl, um, that would be a really interesting text to look at for that. Okay, so that's that's the bit of the conversation directly about the readings that we did. Um, I do want to just leave you with some questions to think about connecting it to the present day, right? So if you look at um, various resistance movements in America, you'll see that uh, many of them struggled with the same question about violence, right? So things like you know, the uh, suffragettes, for example, right, um, who were fighting for women to be given the vote, um, would, uh, some of them, you know, went out there with frying pans in their hand, right? You can, you can, and, and there were riots and they were active and violent in that. Um, the big one that I'm assuming you're all familiar with is, is sort of the division in policy between, um, during the civil rights movement between Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King, where Malcolm X was, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, the Black Panthers were certainly doing a lot of um, feeding children, educating them, um, helping out in the community, but they were potentially willing to be violent as well, right? Um, and that's in strong contrast to Dr. King, who was a minister and preached nonviolence. And his argument, one piece of that, that concept of nonviolence has to do with how people react to you. So I spoke earlier about how, you know, one problem with violence is what it does to you how you become sort of more callous, willing to be more and more violent, willing to use more questionable moral mechanisms. But another problem with becoming, using violence in resistance is that, um, is that people start um, seeing you as violent. It makes it very easy for them to paint you um, as animalistic, as dangerous, and think back to those, um, uh, cartoons from Doc, from uh, Professor Chang, where um, the Irish were portrayed as violent, drunken apes, right? Um, so every time an Irishman, you know, got into a fight, um, 
the English cartoonists would respond by by drawing this sort of caricature, right? And that would kind of reinforce attitudes in England that oh, the Irish really are just so violent. They um, they're like animals. They're like children. They're not fully human. They can't um, they can't rule themselves. They can't be trusted with the vote, right? That was a, a big thread of the argument. This is also the argument that's been made about women, that women are too emotional, they get hysterical, and uh, as a result, they can't be trusted with the vote. Um, and if you look towards um, you know, our current elections in 2016, a big thread of the argument against Hillary Clinton was from people who, who really on a base level didn't believe that a woman could be trusted um, to be rational and, um, and, you know, be capable of being president of a, of a country. And so, um, we're still, we're still dealing with all of these attitudes right now. They're all very much present in, um, in our contemporary conversations. Um, if you're interested in this, um, I, I find Hillary's, uh, various memoirs to be fascinating reading. So, um, you could you could take a look at that. Um, the I think the one I read was maybe called "What Happened," um, and and I think it does a good job of laying out the various forces arrayed arrayed against her, and and one of them was was clearly sexism in a in a pretty hardcore way. There were there were other things too. So, okay. I know this is a little rambly. I'm trying to tie a lot of different things together. And normally if we were in class, we would be pausing this every few minutes and having some back and forth conversation about it. And I really, I'm so sorry we can't do that. So, um, but hopefully you're thinking as you're listening to this and um, forming some ideas uh, that will be useful to you as you start writing your final papers. So, Flash, so so the, the argument that Dr. King made about not using violence is, is in fact the same argument that um, Gandhi makes in uh, during uh, Indians, India's fight for independence. And um, he had this term satyagraha, which um, essentially means the same thing, this sort of philosophy of nonviolent resistance. I'd like to also highlight though that um, Gandhi was very definitely aware of the power of the media and the power of, of shame. Many of the things he did, you read that chapter, Salt, about Gandhi and the Salt March and um, uh, Minal Hadrawala's uh, relative who marched with him on that. Um, he, many of those um, actions were deliberately constructed to attract media attention, to show that the, the Indian people were suffering. Um, when you get, you know, he told his, his followers, you know, if, you, if they come and they beat you as we're marching to the sea to get this salt that we've been unfairly taxed on, then um, don't fight back. You know, if someone's got broken bones, pull them aside to the side of the road and just keep walking, right? Everyone who can keep walking, just keep walking. Don't raise your hand back in anger. And there were journalists there and chronicling this and showing the world, you know, that this is what English rule really is, that it is, you know, beating helpless people who aren't fighting back. And um, Dr. King had similar things. If you watch the movie um, for extra credit, The Butler, um, it shows a lot of this as well. The way that Dr. King would train college students, you know, they'd sit in a, you know, they'd go to a sec to a diner. They were trying to desegregate the diners, right, um, restaurants, and they they'd go there and they'd sit at the counter and they practiced sitting there quietly uh, asking to be served a meal while people came up and yelled in their ear, um, spit on them, touched them, maybe even hit them and not, and then still didn't fight back. They, and he had them practice it because um, it's not easy, right? If 
you're in a violent situation where someone is raising their hand to you, for many of us, I think, um, it's pretty instinctive to fight back. Um, uh, or if you see somebody else being injured, um, someone smaller than you, someone weaker than you, you may want to like step in and swing a fist and violently protect them. And um, Dr. King thought that was um, not going to be the way to get civil rights. And so he um, worked with these young people and, and everyone who was supporting this fight um, to try to maintain a nonviolent posture going forward. So that's another thing that you can look at. You could look at, um, we didn't read them for this class, but you could certainly look at Dr. King's speeches and connect them to some of this material if you wanted to do a sort of rhetorical analysis of, um, of um, violence and resistance. Um, what is effective? What's not effective? What is the effect on your audience? Um, can you use shame to help motivate them? Um, what is the effect on you, right? Um, if you allow yourself to be violent or if you resist, um, resist that urge and try to stay peaceful. And, and just to be clear, I'm, I'm not actually advocating for any particular position here. And I, I would say that I don't know what is the most effective, despite the fact that I've spent a long time studying this. Um, I've read texts from people who were adherents of nonviolence who, you know, after decades of nonviolent resistance felt that it just wasn't working or it wasn't working fast enough. And they turned to violence instead. They said, we're going to have to do this if we want to make progress. Um, and I've read things from people who've gone the other way. So it's a, it's a super complicated subject. I think it's um, very specific to times and place. It does matter who your leaders are and how they position themselves. Um, and to sort of wrap this up and connect it to the present day, you know, a few threads of resistance, because um, there, there, there are lots of different ways to resist, right? And a few threads of recent resistance that I'd sort of call your attention to. Um, one was after the housing bubble crashed, um, the America was going through very tough economic times. I think many of you were probably not very, you know, still kids at this point, but you may remember um, family members who were who might have lost their homes or were otherwise really economically struggling in 2009. Um, they, the Occupy movement arose kind of in response to that, right? And and this phrase was coined the one percent talking about the way in which um, you know the the very wealthy uh, the one percent of the population um, were hoarding much of the wealth and controlling much of the political discourse and I'd argue that the occupy movement which you know at the time a lot of people were like this is just a bunch of people like setting up tents in public places and they don't seem to have an agenda and they don't really um know what it is they're asking for and and i think that's true they didn't really know exactly what they were asking for many of them but they were on they they saw this great injustice and they were going to raise their voices in protest and they were going to put their bodies on the line so they're doing that change the national conversation around the economy i think and i, I i'd say that it made it possible for bernie sanders to run on the sort of democratic socialist platform they ran on, um, which it helped lead to Medicare for all as a rallying cry. I mean, it helped lead, to lead to, it helped make it possible for Obama to um, put the ACA in place. And now we're talking about maybe Medicare for all. Um, it brought ideas like free college or free daycare or even basic income into the national conversation in a serious way, in a way that they really just weren't there before that. All of those political changes, um, which hopefully will lead to big structural changes um, and make everyone's lives easier, everyone except the 1% perhaps, um, I, I'd say came out of the nonviolent protests of the Occupy movement. And finally, 
um, if we're looking at Black Lives Matter, you could connect the same kind of argument to that. And, and please feel free to do that in your final papers if that interests you. Um, talking about the different tactics that people are using to draw attention to this, these problems of um, police violence against uh, Black people and the questions about, you know, uh, the American prison system, um, the way police are trained, the ways in which, um, you know, when we say defund the police, what we actually mean is uh, move maybe some of the money that we're giving to police, we should be giving to social workers instead and training them to do things like, you know, dealing with mental health problems in, that occur in the street, for example, rather than sending um, someone with a gun whose instinct is going to be trained towards violence, right? Um, and, you know, if you're looking at the question of violence, I think that's another another sort of angle you can take is you could look at how uh, police in America have been trained towards a certain kind of violent response. And in particular, how that response is um, disproportionately applied to, to Black people, to people of color generally, et cetera. Um, we don't all get the same treatment. Okay, so that was long. I hope it was helpful um, to kind of help you make sense of weeks six through 10 of the readings. Um, the last third of the course, we will be talking about post-colonialism. So it's gonna be a pretty big shift and we're gonna look at sort of nation building and the consequences of, um, you know, once you've thrown the colonizers out, um, you're left with this broken country that has been through a lot and a very divided people and what are how do we how do we go on from there um and that's where we pick up with Jamaica Kincaid so okay there you go um enjoy the reading I'll be really curious to see what you think of Kincaid thanks guys <laughs>